The following are excerpts I have selected from the book Boyhood with Gurdjieff by Fritz Peters. Fritz was only 11 years old when his aunt, Margaret Anderson, who was a student of Gurdjieff, brought him to Gurdjieff's Institute, the Prieur, in June 1924. In the following excerpts, he describes what life was like for a child living at the Prieur and his duties, some conversations he had with Gurdjieff, an explosive encounter he observed between Gurdjieff and Oraj, and one of the most important lessons he personally received from Gurdjieff. If you enjoy and would like more of this type of content, please leave a comment or a like. The reading commences. I met and talked to Georges Gurdjieff for the first time in 1924 on a Saturday afternoon in June at the Chateau du Prieur in Fontainebleau-Avon, France. I was 11 at the time. Although the reasons for my being there were not very clear, in my mind my memory of that meeting is still brilliantly clear. It was a bright, sunny day. Gurdjieff was sitting by a small marble-top table shaded by a striped umbrella with his back to the chateau proper. He was facing a large expanse of formal lawns and flower beds. I had to sit on the terrace of the chateau behind him for some time before I was summoned to his side for an interview. I had actually seen him once before in New York the previous winter, but I did not feel that I had met him. My only memory of that prior time was that I had been frightened of him, partly because of the way he looked at or rather through me and partly because of his reputation. I had been told that he was at least a prophet at most something very close to the second coming of Christ. Meeting any version of a Christ is an event and this meeting was not one to which I looked forward. Facing the presence not only did not appeal to me, I dreaded it. The actual meeting did not measure up to my fears. Messiah or not, he seemed to me a simple, straightforward man. He was not surrounded by any halo and while his English was heavily accented, he spoke far more simply than the Bible had led me to expect. He made a vague gesture in my direction, told me to sit down, called for coffee, and then asked me why I was there. I was relieved to find that he seemed to be an ordinary human being, but I was troubled by the question. I felt sure that I was supposed to give him an important answer that I should have some excellent reason. Having none, I told him the truth, that I was there because I had been brought there. He then asked me why I wanted to be there to study at a school. Once more, I was only able to answer that it was all beyond my control. I had not been consulted. I had been, as it were, transported to that place. I remember my strong impulse to lie to him and my equally strong feeling that I could not lie to him. I felt sure that he knew the truth in advance. Gurdjieff then asked me two more questions. One, what do you think life is? Two, what do you want to know? I answered the first question by saying, I think life is something that is handed to you on a silver platter and it is up to you, that is, me, to do something with it. This answer touched off a long discussion about the phrase on a silver platter, including a reference by Gurdjieff to the head of John the Baptist. I retreated, it felt like a retreat, and modified the phrase to the effect that life was a gift and this seemed to please him. The second question, what do you want to know, was simpler to answer. My words were, I want to know everything. Gurdjieff replied immediately, you cannot know everything. Everything about what? I said everything about man and then added, in English I think it is called psychology or maybe philosophy. He sighed then. And after a short silence said, you can stay. But your answer makes life difficult for me. I am the only one who teaches what you ask. You make more work for me. It may be necessary to point out here, especially for the benefit of people who have had some contact with Gurdjieffian theory, that I am describing the Institute as I saw and understood it as a boy. I am not attempting to define its purpose or meaning for individuals who were interested in or attracted to Gurdjieff because of his philosophy. To me, it was simply another school different from any school I had known, to be sure, and the essential difference was that most of the students were adults. With the exception of my brother and myself, all the other children were either relatives, nieces, nephews, etc. of Mr. Gurdjieff or his natural children. There were not many children in all, I can only remember a total of ten. The routine of the school for everyone except the smallest children was the same. The day began with a breakfast of coffee and dry toast at six o'clock. From seven o'clock on, each individual worked at whatever task was assigned to him. The performance of these tasks was only interrupted during the day by meals, dinner at noon, usually soup, meat, salad, and some kind of sweet pudding. 
There was tea at four in the afternoon, a simple supper at seven in the evening. After supper at 8.30 p.m., there were gymnastics or dances in what was called the study house. This routine was standard for six days a week, except that on Saturday afternoons, the women went to the Turkish bath. Early Saturday evenings, there were demonstrations of the dances in the study house by the more competent performers for the other students and for guests who frequently came to visit for weekends. After the demonstrations, the men went to the Turkish bath, and when the bath was over, there was a feast or special meal. The children did not participate in these late meals as diners, only as waiters or kitchen help. Sunday was a day of rest. The tasks assigned to the students were invariably concerned with the actual functioning of the school, gardening, cooking, house cleaning, taking care of animals, milking, making butter, and these tasks were almost always group activities. As I learned later, the group work was considered to be of real importance. Different personalities working together produced subjective, human conflicts. Human conflicts produced friction. Friction revealed characteristics which, if observed, could reveal self. One of the many aims of the school was to see yourself as others saw you, to see oneself, as it were, from a distance, to be able to criticize that self objectively, but, at first, simply to see it. The great security of the institute for a child, as opposed to the usual boarding school, for example, was the immediate feeling of belonging. It may be true that the purpose of working with other people in the maintenance of the school proper, which is what all our tasks amounted to, had a higher aim. On my level, they made me feel that I, however unimportant I might be as an individual, was one of the small, essential links that kept the school going. It gave each of us a feeling of value, a feeling of worth. I find it hard now to imagine any single thing that would be more encouraging to the ego of a child. We all felt that we had a place in the world. We were needed for the simple reason that we performed functions that had to be performed. We did not just do anything, such as study for our own benefit. We did things that had to be done for the general welfare. In the usual sense, we had no lessons. We did not learn anything at all. However, we did learn to do our own washing and ironing, to cook, to milk, to chop wood, to scrape and polish floors, to paint houses, to repair roofs, to mend our clothing, to take care of animals. All these things in addition to working in large groups on the customary major projects, such as road building, clearing wooded areas, and planting and harvesting. It was announced that a complete reorganization was to be made in the way the Institute was going to function. And, alarming to everyone, it was also announced that for various reasons, mostly because Gerd Jeff would no longer have the time or energy to supervise his students personally, that not everyone would be allowed to stay on. We were also told that, in a period of the two or three days following this announcement, Gerd Jeff would interview every student personally and decide whether or not they would be allowed to stay on. And, if so, what they would do. By the end of the day, there had been a good many interviews and a number of students had been told to leave. The following day, I went to my work as usual, but when I was going to return to work after lunch, my turn for an interview came. Gurdjieff was sitting out of doors on a bench near the main building and I went to sit next to him. He looked at me as if surprised to find that I existed. He asked me what I had been doing and, more particularly, what I had done since the announcements had been made. I told him, and he then asked me if I wanted to stay on at the prayer. I said, of course, that I did. He said very simply that he was glad I did because he had new work for me. Beginning the following day, I was to take care of his personal quarters, his room, dressing room, and bathroom. He handed me a key, impressing upon me firmly that I was the only one, other than himself, who had a key. And he explained that I would have to make his bed, sweep, clean, dust, polish, wash, and generally maintain order. When the weather required, I would be responsible for making fires and keeping them going. An additional responsibility was that I would also be required to be his server or waiter, which meant that if he wanted coffee, liquor, food, or anything brought to him at any hour of the day or night, I was to bring it. For this reason, he explained, a buzzer would be installed in my room. He also explained that I would not participate in general projects any longer, but that my additional chores would include the usual work in the kitchen and concierge, except that I would be relieved of these duties long enough to perform my housekeeping chores. 
One other piece of new work was that I was to take care of the chicken yard, feed the chickens, collect the eggs, slaughter the chickens and or ducks when required, etc. I was very proud to have been selected as his caretaker and he smiled at my joyful reaction. He informed me very seriously that my selection had been made on the spur of the moment. He had dismissed a student who had already been doing this work and when I had appeared to be interviewed he had realized that I was not essential in any other general function and was available for this work. I felt somewhat ashamed of my pride but was no less happy for that. I still felt that it was an honor. I have never forgotten the first time that I was involved in an incident in his room that was something more than the usual performance of my housekeeping chores. He had a distinguished visitor that day, A. R. R. Raj, a man who was well known to all of us and accepted as an accredited teacher of Gerd Jeffian theory. After luncheon that day, the two of them retired to Gerd Jeff's room and I was summoned to deliver the usual coffee. Orraj's stature was such that we all treated him with great respect. There was no doubt of his intelligence, his dedication, his integrity. In addition, he was a warm, compassionate man for whom I had great personal affection. When I reached the doorway of Gerd Jeff's room with my tray of coffee and brandy, I hesitated, appalled at the violent sounds of furious screaming, Gerd Jeff's voice from within. I knocked and, receiving no reply, I entered. Gerd Jeff was standing by his bed in a state of what seemed to me to be completely uncontrolled fury. He was raging at Orraj, who stood impassively and very pale, framed in one of the windows. I had to walk between them to set the tray on the table. I did so, feeling flayed by the fury of Gurdjieff's voice and then retreated, attempting to make myself invisible. When I reached the door, I could not resist looking at both of them. Orraj, a tall man, seemed withered and crumpled as he sagged in the window and Gurdjieff, actually not very tall, looked immense, a complete embodiment of rage. Although the raging was in English, I was unable to listen to the words. The flow of anger was too enormous. Suddenly, in the space of an instant, Gurdjieff's voice stopped. His whole personality changed. He gave me a broad smile and, looking incredibly peaceful and inwardly quiet, motioned me to leave and then resumed his tirade with undiminished force. This happened so quickly that I do not believe that Mr. Oraj even noticed the break in the rhythm. When I had first heard the sound of Mr. Gurdjieff's voice from outside the room, I had been horrified that this man, whom I respected above all other human beings, could lose his control so completely was a terrible blow to my feelings of respect and admiration for him. As I had walked between them to place the tray on the table, I had felt nothing but pity and compassion for Mr. Oraj. Now, leaving the room, my feelings were completely reversed. I was still appalled by the fury I had seen in Gurdjieff, terrified by it. In a sense, I was even more terrified when I left the room because I realized that it was not only not uncontrollable but actually under great control and completely conscious on his part. I still felt sorry for Mr. Oraj, but I was convinced that he must have done something terrible in Gurdjieff's eyes to warrant the outburst. It did not cross my mind that Gurdjieff could have been, in any sense at all, wrong. There was no question but that I believed in him with my whole being absolutely. He could do no wrong. Oddly enough, and I find this hard to explain to anyone who did not know him personally, my devotion to him was not fanatical. I did not believe in him as one believes in a god. He was right, always, to me for simple, logical reasons. His unusual mode of life, even such things as the disorder of his rooms, calling for coffee at all hours of the day or night, seemed far more logical than the so-called normal way of living. He did whatever he did when he wanted or needed to. He was invariably concerned with others and considerate of them. He never failed, for example, to thank me and to apologize to me when I had to bring him coffee, half asleep at three o'clock in the morning. I knew instinctively that such consideration was something far more than ordinary acquired courtesy. And perhaps this was the clue. He was interested. Whenever I saw him, whenever he gave me an order, he was fully aware of me, completely concentrated on whatever words he said to me. His attention never wandered when I spoke to him. He always knew exactly what I was doing, what I had done. I think we must all have felt, certainly I did when he was with any one of us, that we received his total attention. I can think of nothing more complimentary in human relations. 
When I went for my lesson the following morning, Gurdjieff looked very tired. He said that he had been working very hard most of the night and that writing was very hard work. He was still in bed and he stayed there throughout the lesson. He began by asking me about the exercise that had been given to all of us to do and which I referred to previously as self-observation. He said that it was a very difficult exercise to do and that he wanted me to do it with my entire concentration as constantly as possible. He also said that the main difficulty with this exercise, as with most exercises that he did or would in the future give to me or to any of his students, was that to do them properly it was necessary not to expect results. In this specific exercise, what was important was to see oneself, to observe one's mechanical, automatic, reactionary behavior without comment and without making any attempt to change that behavior. If change, he said, then we'll never see reality. We'll only see change. When begin to know self, then change will come. Or can make change if wish, if such change desirable. He went on to say that his work was not only very difficult, but could also be very dangerous for some people. This work not for everyone, he said. For example, if wish to learn to become millionaire, necessary to devote all early life to this aim and no other. If wish to become priest, philosopher, teacher, or businessman, should not come here. Here only teach possibility how become man such as not known in modern times, particularly in Western world. He then asked me to look out of the window and to tell him what I saw. I said that from that window all I could see was an oak tree. And what was on the oak tree? I told him acorns. How many acorns? When I replied rather uncertainly that I did not know, he said impatiently, not exact number. Not ask that. Guess how many? I said that I supposed there were several thousand of them. He agreed and then asked me how many of the acorns would become oak trees. I answered that I supposed only five or six of them would actually develop into trees, if that many. He nodded. Perhaps only one, perhaps not even one. Must learn from nature. Man is also organism. Nature make many acorns, but possibility to become tree exists for only few acorns. Same with man. Many men born, but only few grow. People think this is waste, think nature waste. Not so. The rest become fertilizer. Go back into earth and create possibility for more acorns. More men. Once in a while more tree, more real man. Nature always give, but only give possibility. To become real man must make effort. You understand this, my work, this institute, not for fertilizer. For real man only. But must also understand fertilizer necessary to nature. Possibility for real tree, real man also depend just this fertilizer. After a rather long silence, he continued. In West, your world is belief that man have soul given by God. Not so. Nothing given by God. Only nature give. And nature only give possibility for soul. Not give soul. Must acquire soul through work. But, unlike tree, man have many possibilities. As man now exists, he have also possibility grow by accident. Grow wrong way. Man can become many things, not just fertilizer, not just real man can become what you call good or evil, not proper things for man. Real man not good or evil, real man only conscious. Only wish acquire soul for proper development. I have listened to him concentrated and straining. I was twelve then and my only feeling was one of confusion in comprehension. I sensed and felt the importance of what he was saying but I did not understand it. As if aware of this as he surely was, he said, think of good and evil like right hand and left hand. Man always have two hands, two sides of self, good and evil. One can destroy the other. Must have aim to make both hands work together. Must acquire third thing, thing that make peace between two hands, between impulse for good and impulse for evil. Man who all good or man who all bad is not whole man is one-sided. Third thing is conscience. Possibility to acquire conscience is already in man when born, this possibility given free by nature but is only possibility. Real conscience can only be acquired by work, by learning to understand self first. Even your religion, Western religion, have this phrase, know thyself. This phrase most important in all religions. When begin know self, already begin have possibility become genuine man. So first thing must learn is know self by this exercise, self-observation. If not do this, then will be like fertilizer. Acorn that not become tree. 
fertilizer which go back in ground and become possibility for future man. That's the end of the excerpts. If you'd like more from this book or other types of Gurdjieff-related material, please leave a comment. Thanks for listening.